You're listening to Tone Benders, the sound designer's podcast. Let's do this. Hey everyone, welcome to Tone Benders. My name is Tim and I will be your host for today. This is our 150th episode. Wow, that's just crazy to me. You may recall that we did special episodes to mark our 50th and 100th episodes, but our 150th, we're just gonna let it slide by without much fanfare. One thing we would ask our listeners is to simply help us spread the word about Tone Benders. If you have any colleagues or friends working in audio post or even just in the film or game world in general, please tell them about us. We do this podcast without advertising in our spare time, so we have no budget to buy ads or anything. We rely on you to tell a friend, mention us in a tweet, retweet one of our episodes, or even repost something on Facebook or Insta. Any help you can give us to get a few more ears is really appreciated. So let's move on. Here's to getting to episode 200. Today we have a rare Tonebenders double header. Today's episode features Eric Hain, who tells us about the hurdles he and his mixed team overcame to complete the Queen's Gambit in less than ideal circumstances. I'm sure you have all seen the Queen's Gambit by now. It's a Netflix mega hit about the chess world in the Cold War era. It's one of the most watched things that Netflix has ever released. Everyone has been talking about it, so I'm sure you know all about it. Tomorrow we're going to release episode 150B, which will come out and features a long talk with the sound editing and Foley team. It's not to be missed, so keep your eyes peeled for it. But for now, let's throw it to Eric Hain. Let's talk some Queen's Gambit. So Queen's Gambit started audio post schedule under kind of a normal world, normal circumstances, and then lockdown started happening all across the world. Some major pivots must have been necessary in order to still get this out on time. Can you talk to me about some of the hurdles that you had to overcome to keep the train on the tracks? Absolutely. With Scott Frank and Michelle Tesoro, Scott Frank, director, and and Michelle Tesoro, picture editor, I think what we had developed with them on Godless was a very seamless workflow and a very seamless approval process in terms of sound. We work in a rolling mix, so we're constantly getting sequences back from Michelle and then mixing them and sometimes either a prototype mix, or which is the first pass we call prototype mix, or continuing and building on that mix uh, with new elements and maybe there's a conform to do or whatnot. But we're always, anything we send back to Michelle, uh, we're putting it through a full mix, technical, creative, uh, mastering pass and just incrementally building that across the month. So that was the seamless part uh, that we had developed. The the interruption part was that, okay, well, we're not going to be able to sit in a room together to review and to talk about the sound mix and to interact like you do on a, on a final mix. We had to look to the tools of what would help us. And one of those things was, was Source Connect. The, the challenge we had was that we had three various places that we needed to beam a signal to. So we had Scott and Michelle and the, and their team in New York and Manhattan. And then we had uh, Carlos, the composer in Miami. And then we had uh, Bill Horberg, who was in a music studio in upstate New York. And what role did Bill play? Bill was the executive producer. Bill has some history with the script and the story and, and the book, uh, I believe, the, the Queen's Gambit, the Walter Tevis book. For us, it was really an engineering challenge, first and foremost, to get a setup going that would make it feel like a very seamless process. So we hit play on our stage in Topanga, it immediately hits play over there in all three of those places. And Scott or Michelle can say, stop, stop, stop. Let's turn that up, turn that down. Let's take a listen to that again. Or, oh, we like more of that. (laughs) And then we can roll back and, and make those adjustments on the fly, live. And sometimes you just have the zoom window up and you just see a thumbs up and you just, okay, keep going. You know, and in a lot of ways it becomes like a final mix when, when you're sitting in the room together, it was, it was really an engineering achievement first and foremost to get to just, just to make it through all seven episodes and set over, I think seven or eight hours of content uh, within a two week period. And then to be able to have it hit such a precise creative mark as well was really a fulfilling aspect of it as well. So technically speaking, you're talking back and forth and visually communicating through Zoom. Right. You have your main system feeding Source Connect to one of those destinations. Were you able to feed multiple destinations from one Source Connect or did you have to send it out to other systems? What we did is we have a, a DAD matrix, Dante matrix. I love those gold little things. Yeah, very handy. And so 
what I did was just molt the 5.1 signal that was going out to this to the speakers, like that output. I just molted that across Dante to uh, two other systems that we had on the stage that were just in case we had a music session that was too wide or something like that. And then, uh, oh, and the picture machine. <laughs> so the picture machine was was receiving a feed from the recorder across Dante. So you had a, like a Avid system that you're running through satellite for the picture? Is that how you're doing it? No, it, Pro Tools. It was all, okay, so it's all through Pro Tools. Video machine running Pro Tools out to a projector and we just molted that signal th- two more times. So one running on the recorder, one running on the picture machine, one running on this idle playback to machine that wasn't in use. And so, and then they were all just satellite linking just to be able to send time code from each of those respective machines as well. And how was the actual communication between everybody in all these different locations? We had signs that that each studio would hold up saying no sync if, <laughs> if I hit play. And then I would just always, as soon as I hit play, I would just look over at the laptop screen where we had sort of the Brady Bunch, you know, style of windows up. And then you could see if Bill had no sync up or Carlos has a no sync and they're just holding a paper up to the screen. <laughs> and, and then that way you can just know and people aren't saying like, you're not having to talk over a loud mix. You can just, I can hit stop and just over the talk back, just say, hey, sorry guys, hold on. Just toggle the time code on and off and try it again. A lot of very analog tools that helped us get through this. Yeah, it's a mix of extreme high technical digital tools and then <laughs> pen and paper. Yeah, yeah. When you get to the final mix stage, the director and the producer are already familiar with what you've been doing and they have been kind of rapid prototyping, I think is the word phrase you use. Uh, how much final mixing are you actually doing? Well, at that point, we're getting a lot of the final music, Okay. which is a very wide recorded with the orchestra and that would probably be an interesting conversation with Carlos and Tom Kramer the music editor to understand how they were able to remotely record that yeah there's a lot of new music uh there's um visual effects sometimes there's a source cue that that come the changes cuz licensing issue or things like that so there, there's a lot of big picture stuff that we're we're dealing with at that point and and a lot of things that Scott and Michelle really care about cuz at that point, we've worked out all the details, like how do the chess pieces sound and how do the clocks work and how do the the clicks on the, the buttons on the, the clocks work. And we're rarely making changes to any of that kind of stuff. Uh, a lot of what we're doing is just hitting play, listening to it, seeing how everyone feels, uh, and, and then making adjustments in terms of uh, music or, or dialogue level. or And a lot of things are overall at that point. We had a pass at one point where... Wiley and I wanted to try, you know, futzing the BBC announcer voice in the final episode. So you hear that voice through like a radio, like a speaker, we had it running through a speakerphone uh, plugin. And it was just something that, you know, we, we had just uh, experimented with, but it was like one of those things that I, I think an example of something where we really had to kind of dig into specific, uh, it was something that Scott wasn't feeling and he wanted it to play more just like an announcer, really like voiceover, which 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 works works great too. Yeah, it worked really well. So that's an example of something that that was changed during the, you know, something we're really digging into. So what was the role that you and Wiley, how did you interact during these final mixes? Is Wiley actually on the faders or is it just you on the faders? Technically just me on the faders, but Wiley and I we have a he he really has a an overall big picture. He's really listening to it like one like a sound designer and two like an audience member and he's He's uh, 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 like a great coach in a way for a mixer. For me as a younger mixer, he's feeding me a lot of gems saying, try this, try that, that no one else needs to hear. And then I can get back on the talk back and say, hey, here, let me show you guys something. And so there's a lot of little things like that that, that we have between him and I that, uh, you know, a shorthand for many years of, of doing this and with directors and picture editors and producers. Wiley's very, you know, there's, we're not hitting play without him. He's translating a lot of the notes or, or sometimes, you know, issues with things and, you know, quickly doing triage. <laughs> <laughs> In a previous interview we did with him, he talked about the idea of an audio director, audio head of department kind of mm-hmm. thing. So that kind of sounds like he's putting that into practice there. Yeah. And it's, and it's, uh, you know, sound director, sound designer, and sound producer. It's a little bit of a different hat for each, each one, but you know, if you're a supervisor managing a crew or you're managing a budget or you're managing expectations from your clients, those are the three hats you're wearing. I think it's inspiring to be around someone who's, who's 
actively trying to practice those three things and really study what, what that means for me, myself as a supervisor, as a mixer, as a sound designer, who's engaging with a director on a creative level, all of that practice is essential to being truly great. Let's talk about the actual show. What was your favorite scene? Maybe something, a hurdle you had to overcome, or maybe just something that you just love the sound of at the end? I love when we're in Mexico City. I think from there, the story really accelerates. Beth is going through her first experience with, with Borgov. The Russian chess master. Exactly. She's maturing in a lot of ways. We're seeing the peak of her mother's crisis and, uh, and the climax of her character. At that point, we're really getting the momentum is really picking up and we're starting to understand a little bit, wow, where this is going. This is going to be, this is going to be hard. There's a lot of like announcer voiceovers in that Mexico City sequence and in various languages and weaving in and that, in and out, uh, and all the music as well. I think some of Carlos's best cues are in that Mexico City episode. I think one of my favorite scenes is a score that Carlos did was in uh, the zoo when she sees Borgoff looking in the glass at the at the other chimpanzees and and, and apes and monkeys, uh, it's just a very complex cue that's morphing from one idea to another. It's a very complex piece of music, and when we're mixing and and thinking about sound design, you know, music is very much a part of the conversation. I, I think one of the things that Wiley's really practiced, and just by us hanging around him, we practice as well this idea that there's no us or them. It's there's us, you know, when we're talking about the mix, it's not like, Hey, did they have this, you know, they meaning the music department. It's no, at that point, we're really having very early conversations with Carlos and Tom uh, to understand how these themes are going to evolve. And and that's some of the simplicity of the mix. Let the music drive the vibrancy evolution of the, of the whole series. The music was great, but the dialogue The dialogue was so clean and crisp. How did you approach the dialogue and how did you get it to sit just right? You know, the dialogue is so important. That's my thing. I think one of the things that I've learned about dialogue from an early point in my life with sound, at like 16 or 17 years old, I said, hey, I want to be a dialogue re-recording mixer. I've just been on a long process of progress to achieve that. And, And still it's a learning process every day, but Something I learned early on was that dialogue should be three-dimensional and dialogue should be sparkly. It should have a lot of high end in it. It should have, because, you know, high end is just what reads and in a mix, you know, the mids are getting taken up by sound effects, backgrounds and music and mids and low range. And so you have that, that high mids and the high frequencies in, in the dialogue that are, you know, really essential. And I think one of the techniques that I use is a, is a multiband compressor to, a fab filter pro MB. And what I'll do is I'll either through clip gain or through just a channel strip, I'll push a lot of high end into a clip of dialogue and then I'll sit on it after with a, with an MB in that, in that frequency range and sort of just do a a compression crunch just in those frequencies. And so what you're able to do is push a bunch of brightness, but contain all the spikes because if you don't sit on it with the MB, you're going to get all those spikes and you're going to get, we call it the ice pick and just things that, that sound unpleasant. But you're able to then sort of bring it out of a mix, almost like a, you know, you're mixing a song. You're getting that piece out of the mix and now all of a sudden you have dialogue that can really sit on top and be three-dimensional. And, and in terms of content that's playing at home on sound bars or TVs or laptops or iPads, it's more essential than ever to do that. I'd say cinematically listening to that kind of dialogue, yeah, maybe you'd notice it being a little too compressed or a little too this or that, but we're moving into that environment and to that, that era of, of home entertainment and, and mobile entertainment. And so I think we've really tried to study what that means in terms of dialogue. I talk to family members all the time and friends and family who are just like, I got to watch this or that with, with subtitles. And, and a lot of times people are blaming it on music volumes or blaming it on other things that are in the mix. And yeah, some of that can be a part of it. And yeah, I mean, myself, I'm, I'm guilty of keeping the remote in my hand because there's just a rock and roll cue that hits and you're just like, okay, I gotta, it's 11 o'clock, gotta, you know, <laughs> tame that back. I like to think of it sometimes like we hear a really loud cue. That means I need to like almost overly push the dialogue level after that cue 
because I know people are already going to be pulling it. <laughs> so that that's sometimes a thing that I think about, like while we're mixing or while we're pre-dubbing dialogue, it, it's, oh, there's a big, there's a needle drop here. And when it ends, people are going to have their remotes down possibly, and they're not going to hear this dialogue, the first bits of dialogue. They're, they're going to be, where'd my remote go and try to turn it back up? <laughs> there are different philosophies on that. Some people have the take that they're mixing for the best possible environment. And if people got to ride the remote, that's what they got to do. I'm not mixing for that. But I think that that way of thinking is almost, I don't want to say becoming dinosaur, but the world is traveling very fast in another direction. And this pandemic is only increasing the speed of that because no one's in theaters right now. Well, not no one, but the vast majority of us aren't. Right. I think it's stealing from music in a way, music industry where for decades people would mixers or artists where they would be sitting in the studio on on beautiful expensive monitors and then they would put it on a tape or burn it on a cd and then go out to their car their honda civic exactly, yeah. and see what it sounds like whenever we're doing mixes we always have like an old crappy tv off to the side or a laptop i believe the technical term is the shit box <laughs> <laughs> nice <laughs> Yeah, exactly. We have our own version of the shit box. And sometimes Wiley likes to bring out the American Airlines earbuds sometimes because, oh, wow. <laughs> you know, it's nice to be able to know what it's going to sound like across all those versions because, you know, we're sitting there in front of, you know, a multi thousand dollar Meyer mains and you can split a hair on those. And who's going to have that at their house or on their laptop? Basically, Queen's Gambit at its heart is kind of a sports show. Right. Yeah. It's about competition, and there are a few scenes of the chess competitions where really cool choices were made. We talked about Mexico City earlier. The play-by-play -play is done in a different language than the rest of the show. So the play-by-play -play is in Spanish. That's a really interesting choice because, as an English speaker, it makes you attack that scene as a, a viewer completely differently because, right. you know, your, your brain is thinking on multiple levels. <laughs> how, how did you attack that uh, kind of in the mix? As soon as I saw subtitles on the screen, you know, I think it's fair game to to <laughs> play around with it. You know, and, and that's the kind of approach we like to take to sound, which is just think of it almost as an architectural piece or, or in the sound industry, people either come from a musical background or a, a techie kind of post-production or that that's where I came from. I came from more of, of thinking of post-production and thinking of sound as a as like if you're building a house and it's like, okay, what do we need? And, and what's, what's going to be the most logical way to get there? And that's not to say that there's not space to be creative and to, you know, push creative ideas. And I think that's where kind of the yin and the yang with Wiley and I, when we've worked together, which is, is really, you know, he's, he's able to keep a lot of those larger creative ideas in mind. And for me, my, the greatest pleasure I get is figuring out the engineering aspect of it and just getting it out to the speakers and getting it out to people and make it a magical experience for you know, a remote mix, make it magical, make it feel seamless. Yeah, magical is the right word. You took a show about chess, which is not the most popular game in the world anymore, and you made it magical, and it's been a massive success, and that's in no small part to the work that you and your sound team did. So congratulations, great work. Really appreciate the time and the platform to talk about The Queen's Gambit. We feel very fortunate to have, have uh, the relationship that we have with Scott Frank and Michelle Tesoro, and it's, it's just a wonderful thing to see people buying chess sets and seeing chess, chess boards sell out because of, uh, because of something you worked on. It made for good uh, Thanksgiving stories. <laughs> yeah, I guess, I guess it would. Thanks again for coming on the show. We're going to have to have you on again because you've been a great guest. Thanks a lot. Cool. All right. Thanks, Tim. Appreciate it. Okay, that was Eric Hain. He was really awesome. I'm so glad he was able to talk to us. Make sure you tune in tomorrow or check out episode 150B for our talk with the sound editing and Foley team. It's really great. They have some cool stories to share, so make sure you don't miss that. Stay tuned after you hear our little credits roll. You'll hear ads for other podcasts you might be interested in. Tone Benders is now part of the Podcast Alliance, a group of sound-related podcasts, and a lot of them are really great, so check them out. Thanks for listening today, and we'll see you soon. Bye now. Tone Benders is produced by Timothy Muirhead, Renee Coronado, and Teresa Moro. Theme music is by Mark Strait. Send your emails to info at tonebenderspodcast.com. Follow us on Twitter via at the Tonebenders and join Tonebenders Podcast on Facebook. Support this podcast. 
You can use our links when you shop with Amazon or B&H or leave us a tip. Just go to ToneBendersPodcast.com and click the support button. Thanks for listening. Hey, this is Christian from a Sound Effect Podcast. In our latest episode, you will hear about designing sound for Netflix series The Crown and composing music for The Haunting of Blind Manor. Check it out at soundeffect.com forward slash podcast. Hi, this is Sam from The Sound Architect. In our recent episodes, I've spoken to composer Patrick Kiest about his recent work on The Kissing Booth 1 and 2, and coming very soon, I'll share interviews with voice actor Jane Perry about her career as well as her role in Cyberpunk 2077, composers Mikolai Stroinski and Gary Scheiman about their soundtrack for Metamorphosis, and composer Chris Velasco about his soundtrack for Carrion. Find us at www.thesoundarchitect.co.uk.